Hello, everybody. Um, it is uh, is a pleasure to be here uh, speaking to you today. Um, we're going to be talking about um, PHP and containers and the interesting way in which Fedora uh, packaging and infrastructure actually makes that be a whole lot smoother than it would be otherwise. So uh, as an overview, we're going to talk about who we are, so you know who's, who's blathering at you. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, Datto's PHP base containers and what's a base container and why we're doing this, um, uh, about packaging uh, native extensions for PHP, and some future directions that we're going to take uh, the, um, uh, the, the processes that we're showing you today. OK, so who are we? Uh, Neil, why don't you start? Sure. Yeah. So my name is Neil Gampa. Uh, I like to call myself a professional technologist. Um, I've been a Linux user for over a decade and a half at this point. I'm a contributor and developer in Fedora, OpenSUSE, Magia, OpenMandriva, and so on. I'm a member of FESCO, Fedora Engineering Steering Committee, for those who don't know. I'm a member of many uh, special interest groups and working groups, notably like the cloud and, and workstation working groups, as well as the KDE SIG and several others. Um, and for my day job, I'm a senior DevOps engineer at Datto, and my primary focus is around software release engineering um, with packaging and containers and stuff where I manage our pipeline with the, with, uh, you know, RPMs, devs, and all the other things that we do. And I'm Daniel Axelrod. Um, I, you can kind of sum up my career um, with I build platforms. Um, and I, tr I, I strongly believe in bringing empathy uh, to technology. Fundamentally, we build technology for people. We build technology to empower people. And if you don't understand the people using the technology you're building, you're not building what you should be. Uh, I've also been using Linux for a while. Uh, I'm a package management nerd. Um, and I am also a DevOps engineer at Datto. Okay, so this this Datto this Datto place, um, what is what is Datto? Uh, so managed service providers uh, MSPs are uh, companies that provide uh, IT services to other companies that maybe aren't big enough to have dedicated IT people, and Datto provides technology and services um, to enable MSPs to to do what they do. Uh, so we've been around for a while now. Uh, we keep growing. We're, we're all over the world. And we have a variety of products uh, with uh, backup and disaster recovery, networking, uh, remote monitoring and management, and um, in, in all kinds of other areas as well. Uh, so that's, that's who we are. That's what we do. We make software for people who keep companies running. Um, and today we're going to talk to you about our PHP base containers and why they are less straightforward than one might hope. So, okay, what is a base container? So uh, the, the containers we're talking about here are um, OCI containers, the kind that you run with uh, Docker or Podman or, or maybe in Kubernetes. Um, and when you build a container, um, if you're doing it with a Docker file, you start with a from line, and you start by building on top of some other container, um, unless you start from scratch. But um, ignore ignore the base case. In every other case, you start with somebody else's container that they've made, and you build on it. And so, um, part of uh, part of the way that Datto empowers uh, its engineers to uh, write applications uh, in containers is to give them a set of uh, solid base containers that they can build on top of. So um, that they get things like secure configuration defaults um, so that we have some alignment on what versions of uh, language stacks everybody is using, um, basically to, to keep, uh, keep lots of dependencies um, uh, managed, uh, making sure they come from maintained upstreams, um, and 
to have less that individual application engineers need to worry about every time they write a Docker file for their app. Um, so we've chosen uh, Red Hat's universal base image um, as the starting point that we build our base containers from. Um, so this is uh, basically a spin of RHEL that is um, intended specifically for containers. Uh, it ends up being a subset of the total set of packages in, in Red Hat. And there's a bunch of niceties that, that optimize things for, um, for being in a container. Um, we support uh, for the PHP language specifically, uh, several versions of PHP simultaneously. And we need to do this because PHP um, kind of makes gradual breaking changes uh, every few years. The, the idea is that it's not a break the world's completely different language and everybody has to change all at once, but uh, every time you upgrade your version, some minor things break and, and you need to fix them. So we end up needing to support several versions at once so that um, people have a chance to gradually transition rather than we're slamming all your apps forward to the to a new PHP version. Um, so in PHP, um, the, uh, the language itself has uh, packages of reusable code. And those fall into two, uh, two main categories. Uh, the first is pure PHP. So these are packages that contain PHP code. Um, this is code that's loaded into the interpreter, just like something you would write if you're writing PHP. Um, and then the, the other category is native extensions. So these are uh, packages that provide uh, code, usually in C or C++, could be several other languages, um, that ultimately get compiled into a shared library. And that gets, um, that gets loaded into the interpreter uh, at, at runtime and uh, interacts with the symbols in the interpreter. So um, we're going to be focusing on native extensions here because the story around uh, anything with, with that's pure PHP is actually already pretty good in the language ecosystem. Um, OK, so let's pretend that we don't have a package manager. What will we do to install a native extension? Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's this process. So we start with getting the sources. Um, sometimes the sources are actually vendored with the interpreter. So there are extensions that you don't necessarily get by default if you build a PHP interpreter, but the code is there. Uh, you can optionally um, you can optionally build them and, and load them in. Um, they might come from uh, Packagist, which is the most popular uh, language repository for um, for uh, PHP code. They could come from Peckle, which is um, the more old school repository specifically for native extensions. Sometimes they're just on you know somebody's Pagger or GitHub or, or GitLab repo and they're not um, and they're not uh, in, in any sort of package repository. Okay, so you have the sources. Now you have to deal with build time dependencies and you recurse into a version of this timeline for each one of those because they're gonna have build time dependencies and they're gonna have to go through the, the rest of this building and installing process. Um, then you actually build the, uh, the shared library um, so you're invoking a compiler. You're usually doing that through um, a somewhat standardized set of, uh, of build scripts uh, that PHP uses. Uh, and then you get to do the same recursive thing with runtime dependencies, because maybe it needs to load stuff at runtime that you didn't need uh, to build it, but um, you still got to have all those. And finally, you install. Um, so the straightforward part of installing is you stick the shared library in the right place on disk. The interpreter looks looks for that loads it fine the weird part with php is that uh php includes configuration files um for uh that tell it uh about each of the shared libraries it should load um and the order in those matters so you specifically have to deal with things like library a depends on library b so i need to tell php uh, the php interpreter to load library b before it loads library a so that all of the symbols resolve correctly. Um, this is challenging, and it basically involves um, a traversal of the of the entire dependency graph. Okay, so traversing dependency graphs, finding sources, building them, figuring out their dependencies, that sounds like a job for a package manager. Um, so sometimes the, um, the language package managers uh, uh, for PHP handle all this really well. But there are there are gaps. Um, 
sometimes the sources, uh, so in the case where sources are bundled with PHP, but not yet built and enabled, um, they can't really, uh, they don't have good hooks for, for enabling those. Um, and this kind of depends on uh, your OS vendor, who, who you're getting your PHP interpreter uh, from, because they've made decisions about what's in that package, what's in other packages, et cetera. Um, the, other, the other really major hole is there's often OS level libraries that are dependencies of, um, of the native extensions you're using. So you might need libyaml um, to use the PHP YAML extension, for example. And because the language package manager is mostly um, uh, OS independent, it doesn't know the details of how to get libyaml on your particular OS. Um, there are a couple of other weird pieces, but um, the, the kind of obvious solution that you're probably thinking of if you've gotten this far in, in the slides and see the giant DNF logo in the corner is use the OS package manager. And uh, DNF is um, is the package manager you get with uh, the universal base image, just like um, other enterprise uh, Linuxes or, or Fedora. Uh, and it turns out it does a really good job of handling all of these, including that weird ordering in the, uh, in the config files of how to get stuff loaded. Uh, so, Obviously, the defaults for your your uh, OS package manager are repositories from your OS, and um, so we're talking about uh, universal base image repositories, which are a subset of Red Hat repositories, and they have some native extensions in there, but not a whole lot. And I understand why, um, because if they had every if if they had every um, PHP native extension. There would be hundreds, probably thousands of extensions um, that they would then have to support for all of the PHP versions they support for a particular uh, enterprise Linux release. And they'd have to support them for as long as all of those different uh, PHP interpreter versions are supported. And for enterprise Linux, that's a long time. Um, so, you know, they've, they've chosen a reasonable subset, but we often need stuff outside of that. Okay, so where do you go when you're using Enterprise Linux and you want uh, stuff that isn't in Enterprise Linux? You go to a fantastic Fedora project called Apple. Um, and Apple 7 had uh, a bunch of um, uh, PHP native extensions packaged in it. Apple 8, unfortunately, does not because um, Red Hat uses uh, modularity to, uh, to handle PHP versions. So anytime you get the PHP interpreter, it's from a module stream. And Apple doesn't yet have the infrastructure for building things that depend on those. Uh, OK, so we can't get them from Red Hat. We can't get them uh, from Apple. But there are all these uh, that are already packaged in Fedora. And it turns out those packages can still be useful to us, even though they're not built for quite the right OS. So how, um, so how do we actually package these things? Yeah, so uh, this is where I take over here because uh, this is sort of the part where uh, I kind of made this a reality for people. Uh, so at Data, we use uh, a software solution for building packages called the Open Build Service. And the Open Build Service uh, was created by the folks at SUSE to build and manage the open SUSE and SUSE Linux distributions. Um, it's similar to Koji, which is the build system that y'all would be familiar with uh, as the RHEL and Fedora build system. But unlike Koji, um, it was designed from the beginning to support a wide variety of Linux-based platforms and out of the box supports building packages, repositories, and images for Red Hat Fedora, SUSE, and Debian Ubuntu systems. Uh, SUSE offers a hosted version as the open SUSE build service, but we use uh, the freely available appliance image uh, to, to support our self-hosted one that we use internally for our stuff. Uh, next, please. So kind of a, a little quick uh, brief on why we use the open build service. So because we are consuming software from a wide variety of sources, uh, we like the source input flexibility through source services that allow us to automate and script retrieval and pre-processing and post-processing of sources to actually do builds. Um, OBS 
the OBS worker setup allow is designed so that we can auto scale by simply spinning up instances of the machines and they'll connect to the orchestrator and connect to them. And then that will add capacity. And then when we don't need them anymore, we can turn off the workers and they automatically scale back down. But the biggest reason why we, we really, really love using OBS is because we don't have to actually think about doing rebuilds when dependencies change because it automatically traces through the reverse dependency map and triggers rebuilds as things change. So this is also not just stuff that's in our OBS instance, but stuff com that comes from the repo. So for example, um, when Fedora uh, updates a library because you know in you know in Rawhide, for example, where a surname bump has occurred, uh, it detects that surname bump change and queues everything that depends on it to auto rebuild. So that eventually we get to consistency, and once all those are successfully rebuilt then it publishes them together. So we wind up having like a, a, a consistent release of content that works all the time whenever the repos change. Uh, and because of all that, we don't have to really think about what it actually takes to make sure the software continues to work. You know, this is also true when Red Hat does, you know, point release rebases for RHEL and UBI. Um, and those things just kind of move up on their own. So we don't really have to worry about it. It's super easy to deploy and get started with because the official appliance on openbuildservice.org uh, is just download, uh, boot up, and you and it starts at the interface and you're good to go. You can just start right away. And it lets us build packages natively for RPM and Debian distributions using RPM spec files. So for Debian stuff, it, it underneath it all, it uses the dev build tool, which takes an RPM spec file and will actually use it to, as, as an input for building a Debian package in the same way RPM build does it to produce an RPM package. Next, please. Yeah, and admittedly upfront, we didn't really have modularity support uh, in OBS, but um, a couple of years back, uh, actually I think it was during the OpenSUSE conference in 2019, uh, myself, the DNF team and, the, uh, and some members of the Fedora modularity team and the OBS team uh, came together to figure out what we should do to support modules in OBS. And so with that strategy that we figured out, the upstream OBS project implemented it, and we focused on bringing that back to the stable release. And so we backported it to the latest stable. And then as soon as that was released, we deployed it on our infrastructure. And it allowed us to start actually using modules to build and release content that, you, that works on Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8. Next, please. So this is a sample from uh, the project configuration for OBS. So some background here. Um, in, in the open build service, you can create projects where they can have um, and package spaces for where the package sources are stored. It's similar to how it works in Copper, where you have um, a project and then you configure uh, builds and packages to go in there. Similar concept, the main difference here is that per project in OBS, you actually can adjust how the solver picks things, how uh, content is accessed. You can do macro overrides and stuff. And in this case, what we're doing is we set the release flag, the release variable. So remember I mentioned earlier that OBS has this auto reverse dependency rebuilding thing. Well, part of that means that it rewrites the release field so that it's automatically incrementing on a, on a rule that allows it to be always considered upgradable. So we just modify that rule so that it includes disk tag, which we actually require for being able to filter and auto publish to the correct repositories. So we do some, some filtering here to deal with the fact that CentOS stream and CentOS Linux were just in the same thing for a brief time. I think some of that it actually could kind of go away over time, but we have some common module enablement that has to be done here. So we need the Apache module to be enabled. We turn off the test because again, um, if you, if you watch the, um, Fedora ELN talk earlier. Uh, you'll you'll probably have heard that Stephen Gallagher mentioned that for RHEL they actually like try to turn off tests in order to remove dependencies that are necessary for running those tests to just simplify the package set. This has the knock-on effect that tests usually have to be turned off for us to be able to build things successfully for the RHEL target. So we do the same, um, and then we just define repository targets that map to module streams. And the reason we do this is so that we can have from a single project, any sources that we push into this OBS project will get auto-built for each of the module streams that we actually care about. So we wanna have one for PHP 7.2, 7.4, you know, maybe when 8.0 is available, we'll do that as well. 
And in each of those, we expand the flags for PHP 7.2, we extend 4, we modify the disk tag so that information is actually present. And we use this so that we can have, uh, for every set of sources we upload, we just automatically get builds for each of the different PHP streams, which allows us to, um, this is a sort of simpler, nicer way of doing stream expansion where we can build layered content on top of all the streams that we care about um, accordingly. Uh, next, please. So the magic for like pulling all the sources in actually isn't terribly magic. It's a, it's a simple script that I wrote called diskit OBS import. It's a, it orchestrates checking out the package sources from diskit server and by default we use Fedora's and it pushes to an OBS instance for usefulness by default it uses the open system build service. Obviously by internally we, we point it to our system and it's written in Python 3 and it re leverages OSC which is the Python based client um, orchestration tool for OBS um, PyGit2, which is, you know, library by, uh, Python bindings for libgit2 to work with Git repos, and FedPackage to interface with the, uh, with the disk git look aside to fetch all the binary sources and look aside. And this is available at uh, pyro slash obs dash packaging dash scripts, and you can, you can check it out. There's some ins basic instructions on how to use it and go from there. Uh, next, please. So with all that, I'll kind of hand it back to Dan so he can talk about how this comes together and, and makes for, you know, a great uh, experience for us. So we have our, uh, we have our specs and sources um, being synced from Fedora. We are building them for um, all of the, um, all of the modularity streams we need uh, to get them in all the PHP versions we need. And Here's how this actually looks um, in the Docker file uh, for our PHP based container. So we are starting with UBI. Um, we copy in a, a repo file, just pointing to the, uh, the repo that um, OBS publishes uh, with our packages. And we install some, uh, we install a PHP interpreter um, and a couple of other things after enabling the um, uh, the module that's appropriate for the version we want. Um, so that gives you the base container. If you're writing an application, this is how simple this is. Okay, I want the PHP FPM 7.4 container. And now I install PHP Peco YAML, which is uh, the, uh, an example of a native extension. That's it. It looks boring, and you should be looking at this and saying, wait, this has all been leading up to this? because it is boring. It's supposed to be boring. It's supposed to be super easy to use in a way that everyone consuming this doesn't have to think about it. The only weird part is, oh, there's an extension that doesn't exist. Cool, please add that to the list of things you're, you're uh, syncing from Fedora and building. Um, and just for completeness, I said we copied in a repo file. This is just a standard repo file pointing to um, the, the repo and the key to uh, enable that uh, DNF repo. Um, so we are, um, we're, we're taking uh, specs and sources from Fedora. We're building them for, um, for various PHP versions uh, for UBI, and then we're installing them into our containers. Um, what's next? How can we do this even better? So the, the biggest thing that we're missing right now is um, the automation works really well if we can build uh, the, the package uh, from Fedora um, just verbatim without changing anything. Um, eventually, we will have reasons to need to locally modify either the spec or maybe add patches to the sources um, for things that are not uh, th that would not be appropriate to upstream. And the, the biggest reason we need to do that is as Fedora moves on, it will diverge more and more from EL8 versions of things. Um, so eventually it's going to be too new for the rest of the OS. And yes, eventually we can move our containers to UBI 9, but there's there, pro there will probably be a, a few year period where we're going to have to patch more and more things um, to keep them backported to the... Um, to the rel versions of, of dependencies and libraries. And I mean, I have a Git repo. I want to modify some things in the Git repo. Like that's that's a that's 
a solved problem. It's just a matter of what kind of workflow do we want to present for this, and what's the best way to hook into the existing scripts to um, uh, to make that easy, and to and to track all of our um, all of our changes well. Um, th so the other major thing is um, uh, having better control over when rebuilds happen. So OBS uh, does a really good job of um, knowing if you rebuild a package, you should also rebuild every package that depends upon that package. Um, and there are some container builders, uh, like the one built into OKD, um, that also does that. If you rebuild a container, um, you should also rebuild all the containers that it depends upon. Um, we don't have anything linking these two right now. So we don't have a way of saying there was just an update to the, uh, the, to the YAML native extension, rebuild all of the containers that depend on that. Um, so, I mean, we can, we can easily fake that with just a schedule. Um, you know, you, you run be rebuilds regularly, but it would be really nice um, for, uh, for resource usage and, and for timing guarantees if instead of a schedule, um, we, we, could, we could do it on demand. And that will require um, some changes to OBS. Fundamentally, we need a way of hooking into OBS to say, okay, and a, a rebuild event just happened, send a webhook to another system. Um, and that's, that's something that doesn't exist in the form we need it yet. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's very addable with OBS's architecture. So that is how, that is the surprising way in which uh, the work being done in Fedora helps us run PHP extensions on containers using Red Hat. Um, if you are interested in, uh, in the stuff Datto is doing, uh, we have an engineering blog. We are hiring for a bunch of different positions. Uh, there's our career pa careers page. And if you're interested in some of the code we write, um, here are our uh, GitHub and, and uh, GitLab works. Um, what questions do people have? Yeah, so I see uh, the first question in here that I see is, oh, sorry, I got questions. Okay. yeah, somebody, uh, so someone asked, uh, did OpenSUSE make OBS? Uh, yes, so SUSE, the company uh, is the company that like is the primary sponsor of the OpenSUSE project. SUSE is the one that made the OpenSUSE build service and the open build service software. So, yes, uh, they did. Um, you know, this person also asks, does it work on CoreOS? I guess. I, like, I don't know what it would be good for. The containers will be fine on, Core OS, on Fedora CoreOS. Um, but it's, it's, it's kind of, it, it doesn't really mean anything um, in, in the CoreOS, in the CoreOS sense, any more than anything else does. Uh, so let's see another question here. Uh, why didn't we use Remy's repository, uh, but instead we reinvented the wheel? So there, there's a couple of we've had some prior experiences not with Remy's repository, but with um, another third-party repository. We got burned enough times uh, because that third-party repository's policy was so aggressive that we wound up um, losing. Uh, content arbitrarily, and um, another aspect of this is we want to have um, much better uh, control in the inputs that we actually wind up uh, exposing to people inside of our container environments. And so we wanted to limit the number of um, self-supported content that people would be using. Uh, and so we went this route. And plus, another aspect of this, honestly, is that we want to actually we wanted to originally do this to contribute to Fedora. Uh, but unfortunately, the architecture inside of for Fedora, uh, in the Fedora project with Apple and with how um, Koji and MBS works uh, for modularity, it, it just turned out to not be possible for us to do these builds inside of Apple because you can't build layered modules. You can't build a package that is supposed to be part of a layered set of modules on top of another module. Uh, and so that just kind of made it, that strategy fall apart. Um, but to be clear, Someone else is asking here for the Fedora ecosystem. What would be required to add and integrate this build function that OBS provides to Koji? Uh, you know, before so, you move on, um... not as much as you think, 
the main piece, the main couple of pieces that are missing um, is some kind of way to do an automatic rebuild counter. Um, so recently, RPM auto spec was added into the Fedora infrastructure, and that allows people to set it up so that they don't need to set or manage the release field, and that's you know tracked by RPM auto spec. It should be relatively straightforward for someone to extend RPM auto spec to also optionally add a rebuild counter. Whenever rebuilds happen without a commit being added to the disk kit, uh, that would allow for the automatic rebuilding to be without you know breaking conformance or like conflicts with inside of Koji storage and whatnot, because you can't have two builds of the same NVR. Um, the other bit is that you need a dependency resolver service that allow that tracks all the content in in Fedora to or in Apple or in RHEL and and automatically kicks off rebuilds whenever things change um, during a qualified change event like a stone name bump or an ABI breakage or something like that. Um, this is not impossible because Koshe already exists and does this to trigger scratch builds. It just needs to be adapted to do something meaningful for pushing real builds. So it's not like the pieces aren't there in the Fedora ecosystem. It's just there hasn't really been any um, drive interest or investment into making it so that people don't have to do this grunt work themselves in, in Fedora. Um, I hope that that is something that will change in the future, but uh, it will, it'll hopefully be a thing that, you know, can help make lives easier. Like we're on this kick lately to like simplify packaging and making it more approachable and to eliminate as much grunt work as possible. And I hope that, that means that we will address this problem as well, because frankly, like even as a, as someone who's capable of rebuilding pretty much anything inside the distribution, I don't like doing it either. Um, so a, a so, follow-up about... Uh, let's um, see, is there any other questions in the Neil, chat can you hear me? or whatnot? So I think I answered all no. the questions in the Q&A. Um, is there uh, anything can other people anyone hear me? else? I cannot hear Daniel. He okay. is listed for me right now as the stream is unable to connect due to a network error. Okay, so I'll start. I'll start talking. Hopefully, now that you um, uh, uh, know, I'm talking. So, so um, if, if Dan's been saying something, I haven't heard yes. it. Okay, so I might have for, to. I don't know if it's my end or his end. Uh, uh, um, can people hear me? Okay, so okay, so. Um, all so, right, so I will reload because apparently I can't see or hear Dan right now. All right, so um, the as a follow-up to the question about uh, Remy's repo, we are effectively a downstream of the fantastic work that, that uh, Remy does. Um, we are absolutely benefactors of, like, a lot of these packages are, are Remy packages, but... Remy publishes things to um, to Fedora um, when they reach a certain level of stability, and um, we wanted to make sure that um, that the packages we used had at least the level of stability um, that that Fedora gives us, um, and that includes things like um, Fedora's policies around. Uh, how quickly um, security fixes happen. Um, that includes basically just, we, we want to make sure more people can work on these things than just Remy. And um, so that's why we had concerns pulling directly from Remy repo rather than, um, rather than relying on the packages that Remy has published, uh, has, has published basically from Remy repo into Fedora. Um, yes, Remy, Remy does accept PRs. Um, so it was, it was more of a matter of, um, if there is a, if there is a, especially I need to be able to tell, uh, our security team, if there are security vulnerabilities, who is responsible for patching them and on what schedule. And Fedora has a very clear answer to that. And at the time, uh, I was not able to find 
uh, the same policy for for Remy repo, which I wouldn't necessarily expect from uh, that's even more work that that Remy would would have to do. Um, Remy is probably doing a lot of the security patches anyway, but it was it was a matter of uh, it, it was a matter of what is the formal policy and if there is a formal policy for Remy repo about that and I missed it, my my deep apologies. So I have no idea what you were saying when I was saying it, and I have no idea whether I was talking over you, and so I'm very sorry. <laughs> it's all good. You you did you did talk over me a couple times, but we got it we got it figured out. It's all good. Okay. Yeah. Well, hopefully my internet connection or your internet connection or the internet's internet connection doesn't <laughs> flick out like this again because it's been doing that lately, and I'm kind of annoyed by it. But uh, yeah, like. Really, at the end of the day here, what we want to do is to provide the maximum amount of community value by by working within the Fedora community, because everything we do there has the widest amount of impact. Like if we if we discover something and we make a fix into a Fedora package, that Fedora package gets to the most number of people. It goes out and it even can have the possibility of spreading out to places like RHEL, to other downstreams, and, and it's just from from an impact and from the value of the impact of actually doing it there, it, it's so much higher than pretty much everywhere else. That said, I'm pretty sure we have actually made PRs to to Remy repo before. Um, yeah, we've done a few fixes here and there to to, to his repo, so it's it's not yeah. unheard of. We we, but yeah, ultimately we we um, we want to pick the upstream that's that's best for us to consume and also work with the upstream uh, that makes the most sense for any particular change. And, you know, the other aspect of this is, um, uh, at least personally speaking, like the other aspect is that uh, I like being able to see the builds. I like being able to see the build logs and then like seeing how builds happen. And Remy does a lot of great work and his repository is amazing. And I definitely use it as a reference from time to time and do contribute to it occasionally, but uh, I, I don't actually have the ability to see how he builds his packages. And that is um, a concern for me personally. Like I, I like to be able to do a trust but verify kind of approach to things and that's very hard when you don't have a way to see how the builds happen. Not that I'm saying Remy's a bad guy, but like the Fedora Koji is public. I can go look at any build log, I can see all the build inputs, I can see the record of the build environment. It is a lot easier to trace when you have all that information. Ah, so how do we get Red Hat build logs then? Ah, uh, so now we're talking about the whole trusting trust thing, Robert Schick. Um, well, after a certain point, it is, it is. I I really am trusting that the vendor is is a, is good at what they do, and you know when it's a vendor that has been trusted and reputable and works with the community as much as Red Hat does, and Functionally, almost everything that they do has actually a public counterpart that you can see the integrity of the builds, and it's relatively straightforward to identify whether there are any deltas between the two. Um, I'm satisfied for the most part. Um, would I like that to be better? For sure. But and, I'll take what I get. <laughs> and a lot of the infrastructure work on CentOS Stream, my personal hope is that that eventually gets us to a place where, yeah, all that infrastructure is out, out in the open and we can see Red Hat build logs, why not? Right, uh, and like, I'm very perfect. optimistic for that. Like if you look at CentOS Stream 9, it's pretty clear that's pretty much what's happening. Um, you know, it's a hop, step, skip and jump away for having, you know, the actual rel logs like that there. Like offhand, I think the only real delta between the two is is it CentOS release or is it Red Hat release? Beyond that, like as far as I'm aware, based on the process and what 
um, Carl George and the other folks in the CentOS stream uh, team have told me there is no difference. So we're already in a better place. Any chance we are working on the PHP 8 available in Stream 9 dev? Uh, funny, <laughs> funny you should ask Neil that. <laughs> so uh, the funny thing about that is uh, I noticed early on that Stream 9 didn't have PHP 8. And so I filed a tick, uh, I filed a bug report saying, hey, yo, uh, you sure you want to keep this at, at, at PHP 7.4? for another decade, because I'm pretty sure you don't want to do that because PHP 7.4's EOL is like next year or something like that. And and you want to have, you know, be on the major version of the architecture for, P, for the PHP interpreter for the next decade. And they're like, oh yeah, yeah, we'll do this. And I think they just closed the bug this morning because they finally verified that they verified that it was actually pushed like a month ago or so to uh, to have PHP 8 uh, in CentOS Stream 9. So yeah, the, it's there. Um, I kind of hope that there will be a bridge stream between uh, UBI 8 and UBI 9 of PHP 7.4 so that um, it makes it easier for us to ramp from UBI 8 to UBI 9. At least you know the last time I talked to some folks uh, about how this is supposed to work was that um, there would be a so-called bridge stream where the stream that was supported, the, the latest stream that supported on um, on RHEL 8 would actually also be available in RHEL 9, along with the new defaults and all the new stuff on top of it. Um, that hasn't happened yet. Uh, at least I haven't seen that content in CentOS Stream 9 yet. So I'm still crossing my fingers that that's actually going to be a thing, because that'll make it so uh, we can more aggressively move from 8 to 9, because uh, that doesn't make it contingent on us doing uh, a PHP bump again. It's already right now, like completing our transition to PHP 7.4. And uh, I would like for us to be able to do, well, we're on 7.4. Let's take a checkbox in our build system. And now we got all the extensions just auto rebuild for 7.4 on RHEL 9, and then just switch the base containers and nobody cares. That, that's, the, that's the dream. We switch the base container and nobody cares. Everything is transitioned over, it's seamless, and we're in a more secure position because we can ramp up from rel release to rel release, uh, honestly, the days. Like, that that's how fast we can do these turnarounds if everything is working as, as, well, as, um, as well as we hope. So, uh, any other questions from anyone? Or am I, again, so not hearing Dan speak? No, no, I think you're hearing me now. OK, yeah, I'm hearing okay. you now. Um, and uh, Robert Sheck, I do want to thank you for mentioning Remy. I woke up this morning um, thinking, oh, no, we don't have a Remy slide. I definitely need a slide where we acknowledge uh, Remy's work in Remy repo. Um, and then a billion other things prevented me from getting into the slide. So. Thank you for making sure Remy's work got mentioned because, uh, yeah, none, none of this would be, I mean, we'd find a way to do it. It might be possible. None of this would be feasible at the scale we're doing it without the work that starts in Remy repo. Yeah, and Remy and I have done a lot of work together over the years as I've ramped up work in within Datto on you know, UBI based PHP and stuff like that. And even before that, when we were working on getting stuff moved on to PHP 7 and then later on to newer 7x versions and things like that, I try to make sure that, you know, I can help wherever, wherever I can figure things out and stuff like that. And he's been, he's been, he's been good to work with and, and he does a lot of great work and it makes our lives considerably easier. And I I actually, out of my own pocket, I donate to him every once in a while when I have I have money to give to kind of keep his, his services going. So, you know, if you if you benefit from Remy Repo, you know, go throw him a few bucks. Buy him a pizza. Yeah, uh, so um, Garrett. Tucker says, uh, and I'm going to just quote you because your your stuff is long here. You're as a as you're a product security engineer at Red Hat. 
uh, although the build logs aren't visible like Fedora's, there's, I don't know if I fully agree with the statement that there's a little bit less need for the trust, but verify for each package or new build review. Um, it, it, the the idea that you know the fact that there's a the whole because there's a whole team and there's the you know there's the reputation there like open source is built on reputation first and foremost that's that's pretty much how this works um but having having every everybody is human and it is important to acknowledge that the more eyes that are on something the you know the less likely you're going to have you know major faults and problems like uh I can, I, I have certainly caught, you know, my fair share of things that were kind of, you know, slipped through the cracks um, uh, in, in CentOS before, and I've sent fixes and they've been fixed. And like, I'm glad we have CentOS stream as a pipeline to be able to send those things and get them fixed. Uh, I don't want to kind of make the, I don't want to make the assertion that there's anyone that's infallible. Not me, not Red Hat, not Dado, nobody. Like nobody's infallible. What we can do, though, is we can do the best we can to help support each other to make sure, you know, the quality of what we provide is at the highest that can possibly be. And while maybe the trust but verify is a tad bit less necessary with Red Hat, because, again, reputation, contractual agreements, things like that tend to make this, you know, like recourse and stuff. But visibility and transparency are important too. And I think that it's something everybody should strive for, even in commercial companies. Like if you're an open source company like Red Hat or SUSE or whatever, there's honestly no reason not to at least be transparent about your build blogs or any of those other things. Like, what are they going to hurt? Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's. It's more about like at a certain level, like there's only so much, you know, I, I do obviously have to leave some kind of trap for someone else. And, and you know, there's, there's ways to be obfuscation and things like that. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really just a matter of like, I want to make sure that we understand where everything's coming from and where it's going. And, and that's the kind of thing where it's, if Fedora is nice in that regard. And so, so it, it makes me feel comfortable with being able to use anything from there because I can easily compare what I'm doing versus what they're doing and see whether I'm doing it wrong or they're doing it wrong and then have the be empowered to fix it. Like that's, those are the two sides of this coin that matter. Like you can see something and you can say something. And because I can do both, it's quite great. Uh, but yeah, I really would like to be able to uh, build these Apple, these PHP modules in Apple and have them in modules that can depend on the base modules in RHEL because I would really just much rather do that because it's, it's more beneficial to the wider community. Uh, unfortunately, like the infrastructure around Fedora Apple is not in the greatest of shape when it comes to being able to support the modularity technology. And unfortunately, I understand why. There's architectural things that make this sort of difficult, but I'm crossing my fingers that someday that will be resolved. Although I am kind of impressed that uh, a uh, a product security engineer decided to come to our talk. That was that's cool. I love you people. You're great. Red Hat product security sends me all kinds of bug reports to all of my packages, and like even though they don't have to, and they do. It helps me make sure that my stuff is, is good and secure too. So I love you guys. Let's see, I so we got uh, just a few minutes left. Is there anything from anyone else? Uh, or are we just gonna apparently talk about Red Hat customer care tickets in the chat now. <laughs> this this I, just makes me laugh. <laughs> honestly, this is what conferences are all about. It's it's about getting people who otherwise might not talk to each other um, talking about things they wouldn't otherwise be able to talk about. So I I love that. I love that that people were able to come together and make a connection. Oh yeah, that was fantastic. I just find it amusing that you know also GSS slash CEE. That is in the brief.
Did we lose Neil or is it just me? Yeah, okay. I think we I think we lost Neil. I'll um I'll I'll message him elsewhere. Um one moment. Uh regardless, I think we're I think we're pretty much wrapped up. We'll we'll stick around for uh for the next few minutes uh, in case people have more questions or wanna chat about um I was gonna say chat about more tickets, but that seems like a, a terrible thing for me to offer since I have no power to uh to help anybody with those tickets. Okay, yeah, if we have if we have no more questions, I um I just wanted to thank um the the Fedora community um for making all this cool stuff possible. It is um it is an incredibly great project, an incredibly great community, and um it's fantastic to continue to find new things that are enabled by the community, even though nobody within the community thought of them. It's like, you're making a cool thing, we can build on that thing to do something neither of us ever thought of before. So um, thank you everyone, no matter how you're involved in that community. <laughs>